want to begin tonight and uh, just start by this saying we, we always say we got to practice what we preach, uh, but it's also important that sometimes we need to preach what we practice, and that's why I am doing this series on baptism and covering this material, because I think it's very important that we understand why we do what we do, even how we do what we do. There's a, there's a really interesting story I remember reading from the Middle Ages, 5th century. It was of St. Patrick of Ireland and King Angus. King Angus came to Patrick and he wanted to be baptized, so they, they got prepared for the ceremony. And Patrick, he had this, this staff that he, he used. It was kind of ornate, and he would, he would use this to help him stand while he walked. Well, he accidentally stabbed the king right in the foot with this staff. But the king never said anything. And they went ahead and had the baptism. The baptism is over. And St. Patrick looks down and he notices the king's foot is bleeding profusely. So immediately Patrick apologized. He said, I'm so sorry that happened. Why didn't you say anything? And the king said, well, I thought that was part of the ritual. And we don't we don't do that. But we do baptize, and I want us to understand and know why we do that. So tonight we're we're gonna we're gonna just let let the Bible do all of the talking on on water. There are uh, there are some churches that have little, I would say even no place in some churches for the practice of baptism. But frankly, they are very much in the minority. Most churches of different stripes and different traditions actually put quite a bit of significance on baptism. But you might not know that to go there because a lot of churches, they just never, ever talk about baptism. And I think there are two reasons that we often underemphasize an act that we think is really important to do. First, write this down. There is a concern for promoting works righteousness. And we talked about that last Wednesday night quite a bit. We're, we're concerned that we're going to make the gospel into something that man actually has to do to try to earn salvation. But no church that I know of wants to teach that a man can save himself or that God cares about externals more than he actually cares about our heart. And if you're not careful, baptism can be presented in that kind of a light. And I've heard it presented that way. I've heard baptism presented in such a way that the focus is actually off of the cross and it's more on the performance of man. And, and because that can happen, I think some churches are afraid to talk about baptism at all. So, so that won't happen. And then there is another reason that I think churches are afraid to deal with this topic in general. And that is a concern about religious division. Baptism was actually meant to be a, a uniting act, and yet it is often the focus of serious debate amongst different churches and believers. Now, I don't need to tell you this, but we live in a very secular age. We are no longer in a Christian culture. And consequently, believers don't have a lot of energy to battle other believers when it is just so hard to hang on in this society yourself. So the result is that we want to avoid questions that are going to create controversy. And I think most of you know that I do everything in my power to avoid controversy. Honestly, though, when you when you come across issues in the New Testament where it has little or almost nothing to say, I really believe with all my heart that avoiding controversy is a very wise thing to do because we can spend a lot of time debating things that the New Testament doesn't even tackle or address at all. But the division surrounding baptism is not due uh, to, uh, well, that just threw me for a loop, to a shortage that we have of biblical texts. I couldn't even deal with all of the important texts that that come with baptism um, in just a particular sermon. The problem that we look at when it comes to the division that there is with baptism in different churches is that we've already decided what we think those different Bible texts mean. I think that that we are guilty of that as well. We're going to decide ahead of time what a, a Bible passage actually means. I remember hearing the story 
of a fellow who's just outside of Memphis. He's out in the country and he sees these two boys and they're being attacked by a couple of roaming dogs and he jumps out of his car. He, he runs and he grabs the dogs. He ends up killing the dogs, saves these boys' lives. And the local uh, newspaper editor out in the country, he saw everything that happened. He jumps out of his pickup truck and he, he runs over. He says, you, my friend, are a hero. And tomorrow's headline is going to say, Memphis man saves boys' lives. The guy says, well, honestly, I'm not from Memphis. He says, that's okay. It'll say... Tennessee man saves boys from wild dogs. He said, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm not even from Tennessee. I'm from Connecticut. So the next day, the paper's headline read, Tennessee man, or the paper said, Yankee kills family's pets. We've, we've got these ideas about subjects that we have been told all of our lives. So it's it's hard, I think, when it comes to either side of the equation regarding the issue of baptism to just let the Bible actually do all of the talking on this subject because we, we already have made up our minds and, and we don't want to say more than what the New Testament actually says on the issue of baptism, but I also don't want to water baptism down and say less than what the New Testament says about it because that is going to just challenge our presuppositions. So what I want to do tonight is I want to just let the Bible actually do all of the talking And we're going to look at passages, some very major, important texts, and let the Bible speak. Last week, we looked at the Gospels and what the Gospels had to say regarding the topic of baptism. And tonight, we're going to start in the book of Acts, and we're just going to kind of head west in our Bibles at some of these texts. You don't have to wait very long before you come across a very significant passage on the issue of baptism. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 It reads this way. Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're just barely out of the Gospels when we meet baptism in a significant way. Peter says that that the water and the spirit meet at Baptism. Baptism is this new birth that Jesus was talking about. We talked about last week in John chapter 3. And right away, this, this challenges a presupposition because many have already decided that baptism cannot have anything to do with a saving moment. And yet Peter is suggesting, yeah, it, it does. It says, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And people say, it just can't mean that. It can't possibly mean that. It it has to mean be baptized because your sins have already been forgiven. Well, let's just let the Bible talk. I, I have problems with that interpretation. I've had many people tell me that's what it actually means. Well, here's, here's my problems. Number one, that's not what it says. You find that exact phrase for the forgiveness of your sins in Matthew 26. Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 28. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Those exact same Greek words, the exact construction is what we see in Matthew 28 for the forgiveness of sins. And does anybody believe in Matthew 26 that Jesus poured out his blood because our sins were already forgiven? Nobody believes that is what it says. Another problem that I would have is that we wouldn't say that you repent because your sins are already forgiven. You repent because you need to seek forgiveness. But the biggest contextual problem is really this for me. Peter has just preached this sermon. You look at Acts chapter 2 about how the people he's preaching to, they are the ones that crucified their own Messiah. And the Bible says as they're listening to Peter, they were literally cut to their heart and they were broken. And they asked the question, well, what do we do? And they're not asking what to do because their sins are forgiven. They're asking what to do to get forgiven because of what they had done. And this is what they're told. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ 
for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you, you might be thinking, well, can water, can water take away sins? I've been told all my life that can't happen. Well, you've been told correctly. Water cannot take away sins. But let's look at the next verse that we come across. It's in the book of Romans, one book over, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And it says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, I want to I want to stop just for a moment, make a little side point. What does the word baptize actually mean? It actually means to to dip, to plunge, to immerse. That's the idea that you get out of this text. We were buried in baptism. And at this church, we practice Total immersion of believers because we think the picture ought to look like what it actually stands for. The reason we do that is because we believe baptism is an identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now notice Paul does not say we were believed into his death. He doesn't say we repented into his death. He says we were baptized into his death. Some people say that at baptism, it, it, baptism, it's just a symbol. No, it is so much more than just being a symbol. Baptism is a participation literally in the resurrection and death of Jesus. And that is important because it's in dying that Jesus shed his blood. And you need to listen. Water can't remove sin. The water in, in our baptistry can't even remove thirst because it comes from the Des Moines waterworks. The only thing that can remove sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you, do you think Pilate, when he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash my hands of this matter, do you think he was no longer responsible because he put his hands in water? No, it is the blood of Jesus that literally takes our sin away. And he shed his blood when he died. And Paul is saying that when you are baptized, somehow you were connected. You actually participated in the dying of Jesus. You, you contacted whatever it is that Jesus accomplished when he died. And so the historical saving work of Jesus has its fulfillment in a specific historical event in your life. That is what Paul is saying. So you look over in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 13 through 15, Paul writes, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Now, after all I've said, I've made baptism sound pretty important, so this is often a text that, that others will bring out and say, look, look, you, you read this text right here. It obviously shows baptism is not that important. Paul said that he was thankful he didn't do any baptizing. But you need to look again because I think it's saying just the opposite. This text is presupposing the very importance of baptism because right before this text in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul is saying that, there were some that were saying they belonged to Peter, some that were saying they belonged to Apollos. And what was happening was in the early church, baptism was, was so important that the administrator, the one that was doing the baptizing, was often this, this object of special allegiance. And it even challenged in some people's minds the place of Christ in their life. And it would lead to factions and divisions in the body. And Paul is not denouncing baptism. What Paul is denouncing is denominationalism. What he's denouncing is men that, that line up in parties instead of following Jesus. And he's insisting that only the name of Jesus is worthy of our allegiance. Now, I want you to give me just a couple minutes because this is very important. One of the great tragedies, I think, in the Christian church today is that we have denominationalized baptism. Churches actually teach your baptism doesn't count for us. Because you weren't baptized in our church. And I know of folks who've been told 
They can't be a member of a church unless they actually get baptized in that church because their baptism did not count. That's unbiblical. That's totally denominational. But our churches have done the exact same thing, and it's just as denominational, just as unbiblical. When somebody obeys Jesus and they are baptized into his death and his resurrection, that person has experienced a new birth. That person is a a Christian. We say, well, some people, you know, they didn't understand everything that the Bible teaches about baptism. Neither did you. Neither do I. The idea that that you have to understand every single thing and promise about baptism before your baptism actually counts, that's erroneous. God will give you all of the promises of baptism, though you don't actually understand all the promises of baptism yet. So that idea that your baptism was not perfect, that's actually works righteousness. That's teaching that if you get baptism down good enough, if I understand it well enough, That's when God will have to count what I do. Are you saying, preacher, that you have to accept brothers and sisters uh, as brothers and sisters, people whose whose understanding and, and their lives are not totally perfect? I don't have any choice. Those are the only kind of brothers and sisters I actually have. What Paul is saying is not to take the powerful and beautiful picture of baptism and cheapen it by attaching a man's name to it or a church's name to it. Baptism is not about coming out of a party. It's about coming into Christ. And he says something very similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Men don't decide who is in the church. God does that. Acts 2.47 says that it was God that was adding individuals into his church. It wasn't men. So when, when my wife and I gave birth to, well, when she gave birth and I was present to Jonathan and then Jacob, we didn't have this vote on whether we're going to allow Jonathan and Jacob to be part of our family. Their birth put them in our family. And that's what God is saying. When someone is, is born of water and born of spirit, God literally puts them in the family. The father does that. And the brothers and the sisters are supposed to feel good about it. Look at another very important text out of Galatians. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Notice, please, I want you to just let the Bible speak on this. It does not say all of you who are clothed with Christ have been baptized. Let's try to get our presuppositions just kind of put aside and just let the text speak. Because Galatians 3 is a very powerful passage of scripture. Whenever someone says, well, I can't believe baptism is necessary because then I would have to believe that you're saved by works. Well, I take them always in a discussion to Galatians chapter 3. And here's the reason. Because in Galatians, Paul is dealing very vigorously with this whole doctrine of salvation by works. That's why he wrote the book of Galatians. Paul says anybody that preaches that kind of gospel, let him be accursed. He's so strong on it. He says those guys that say you need to be circumcised first, I wish they would just go and mutilate themselves. He is vigorously condemning salvation by works. And in the very chapter where he does this, chapter 3, he affirms baptism. Don't miss that because that's very important. Paul condemns salvation by works, but he endorses union with Christ through baptism. It's at baptism that you and I are joined with Christ. We are literally clothed with Christ And the reason that's important is because every spiritual blessing and promise that one can have through baptism can only be found when you are in Christ. Romans chapter eight, verse one. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Every blessing that that you want from God, every blessing that that he promises, the Bible says when you are clothed with Christ, that comes to you in Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter four. This is a very important passage. There is one body, 
one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all. And notice the royal company in which baptism is placed. These are the essentials on which the entire church need to unite. There are so many things in the Bible that are very hard to understand and about which, frankly, there's never going to be agreement in the church. But one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Those are the things around which the church can actually gather. A book that we've studied or in the middle of studying a great deal. Colossians chapter two, verse 12. Says, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism isn't something you add on to faith. It's an expression of our faith and something else that you need to know. One reason that we believe that people old enough to confess Faith in Jesus ought to be baptized. The reason that I don't baptize babies is because passages like this convince us that baptism is a faith expression. I don't personally know how old a person has to be before they're old enough to understand who Jesus is or old enough to make their personal decision that they believe that he's the son of God and want to follow him. But I do know that that's what they have to understand. When they get baptized at at its very heart, baptism is not a work. It is faith in the work that God does. God has done this many times in the Bible. Many times God has asked for a, a visible demonstration for faith in his promise. He said to the children of Israel, I want you to march around the wall seven times. It wasn't the marching around the wall that brought the wall down. It was the faith. But if they had not marched around the wall seven times, the wall would not have come down. He said to Naaman to dip seven times into the river. It wasn't the water in the river that took away the leprosy. But God was asking for a visible expression of his faith. He told the Israelites, look up at that pole and your diseases will go away. Over and over and over in in the Old Testament, we see these examples of God saying, I'm going to work a miracle, but what I want is an expression of your faith in my power. That's what you do when you are baptized. Paul says it is your faith in his power. That's all we contribute to baptism. It's our faith in his promise. Now, we studied the entire book of of Titus at length. Titus chapter three, verses four and seven, four through seven say this. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. The Bible says that this washing of water and spirit is a gift of the grace of God. Rebirth is something, not something that you and I do. It's something that God actually does to us. By the way, it's it's easier to witness that than explain it. I mean, don't ask me how to explain how the spirit comes into a person's life and regenerates them. Jesus compares that to the wind in John chapter three. He said, you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going And you can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind. And I can't explain how the Holy Spirit works, but I can tell you, I can see the change when the Holy Spirit is present in a person's life. First Peter, chapter three, verse twenty one. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember the story of Noah, how God used the water to transport Noah when he was in the ark from a world of sin to a an old world of sin to a a new creation. Literally, Noah was safe because he was in the ark. As a side note, my wife and I were excited because we're going to go in July. They're opening up the 
the Ark Encounter at the Creation Museum in Kentucky, and we're going to go visit that and, and see this literal life-size ark that they've built. It is huge. And I don't know if you've seen any pictures of it on the Internet or not, but it is massive. So we're excited to go, go see that. But the Bible says the believer in the same way is going to pass literally through God's judgment of sin because he's going to be in Christ. Like Noah was in the ark, we are in Christ and we are going to be separated from this from this old life of sin into this new creation through a water and grace experience. Again, I want you to understand that I don't think that that mere external observance can save you from sin. Peter says it's literally the appeal of your heart for cleansing. That's the grace of God. We don't boast in anything here except in the finished work of the resurrected Christ. But we can boast in the work of Christ and still talk on water. Because, the bab- but because baptism speaks of the work that we boast in. So four things. Write these down about baptism that we see. Number one, baptism is a request for newness. Our need is not for more religion. Our need is recreation. And I believe the Bible teaches that process begins when we submit to baptism. The way that you fix a jerk like me is you put him to death. You kill him. And you bury him. And you start all over again through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sam Houston was the first president of Texas. He was also a very immoral man. He was a drunkard. He was a profligate. And late in his life, Sam Houston came to Jesus And there was a Baptist preacher named Burleson that was going to take him out to a creek to baptize him. Little Rocky Creek, November 19th, 1854. All of Texas came out to see if Sam Houston would actually accept Christ and be baptized. He took him down into the creek and he baptized him. And when Sam Houston came up, Burleson said, Sam, all your sins have been washed away. And Sam Houston said, I pray all of God's help for the fish. Life can be a do over. But you must ask God. That's what baptism is. It is a it is a request for newness. You are asking God to start all over in my life. Second thing that we learn about baptism. It is a declaration to faith, not an addition to to faith, an expression of faith. Remember the word work is never used in our New Testaments in connection with baptism. Someone asked Martin Luther one time that if he believed that salvation was by grace through faith, then why are you so insistent on baptism? And Luther said, yes, it is true. Our works are of no use for salvation, but baptism is not our work. It is God's baptism gives substance to faith by visually and and verbally pointing to the saving work of Christ. Baptism says nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling. Third, baptism is a powerful call to unity. When you look all through the New Testament at the text that we see on baptism, you keep coming across the same kind of phrases. One baptism, baptized into one name, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. The church is one because we all came in the same way. We entered through the same doorway. And I think one of the great ironies and tragedies of the Christian church is that Satan has used what was intended to be the central point of of unity to divide believers. Baptized people should place a very high priority on unity. Finally, baptism is a pledge of allegiance. Max Lucado preached on baptism. He said, baptism is the difference between a car buyer and a tire kicker. Baptism is, is your, your going public with your pledge To follow Jesus. Would you want to be married to somebody that didn't want anybody else to know it? 
And would you, would you be impressed with somebody that, that proposed to a woman and said, I want you to be my wife, but I just don't want anybody to know that we're married. Baptism is God's way of saying, I'm not going to let my life be secret initiatives with Jesus. I'm going to go public with Jesus. Baptism is, is your announcement to the world that you have pledged your life to Jesus. I heard a story of a, a young man that was, was thinking about getting baptized for a long time and he knew he was ready to be baptized. And one Sunday morning he came up to the preacher. He got it wrong, but he said, Preacher, today I want to be advertised. He got the word wrong. He got the idea right. Because that is exactly what you do. You, you are literally saying to your church and to everybody who witnesses that you are literally ready to be advertised for Jesus. And I just wonder as I kind of close out this particular lesson, does the world actually know where you stand with Jesus? Jesus.